Tonight we have Cassandra Rippey from the Coquille Indian Tribe. She is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer there. Um, she's actually doing some fun stuff. Maybe she'll give us a little bit of peek into today. Um, but we're going to talk about the historic preservation at Battle Rock. I'm going to share my screen here so y'all can see her presentation and then I'll let Cassie take it away. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us and for supporting the museum. Um, as she said, my name is Cassandra Rippey. Most people call me Cassie. I am the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Cocoa Indian Tribe. Um, I'm also an archaeologist. Um, you may hear the, uh, have, hear the phrase TIPO. Um, TIPO is just the abbreviation for Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Today, I'm gonna to share with you a case study in historic preservation. It's the story of an important place to the Coquille Indian tribe and really to all of Oregon. Before I get into those specific details of this particular story though, I wanted to share a little bit of background and also a disclaimer. Uh, this is, today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, tragedy about the tragic deaths of many people. This is not a subject that I discuss lightly, um, and I don't share this information to um, sensationalize the story, or um, rather, I'm, I'm, I share the story today so that you can be aware and armed with the knowledge, um, hopefully help us protect this place and those that rest there. Um, Ariel, go ahead and next slide. Thank you. So I thought it would be helpful to start by sharing a little bit about what tribal historic preservation officers do. You may or may not be familiar with SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office. SHPO is a branch of the Oregon State Government authorized under federal law. Um, SHPO is responsible for supporting efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect um, historic and archaeological resources on both public and private lands throughout the entire state. TIPOs are the tribal counterpart to SHPO. TIPO jurisdiction, though, is strictly on tribal trust and reservation lands. I'll clarify that um, TIPOs are not always tribal members. I myself am not. TIPOs are also not always archaeologists. Um, the qualification for what a TIPO is depends on the tribe, and every tribe sets their own, uh, own, own qualifications. Additionally, not all tribes have TIPOs. So this year, 2020, uh, there are 574 feder federally recognized tribes in the United States, and approximately just 200 of those have TIPOs. Um, the rest may have cultural resources staff, but they, they will still work with the SHPO and the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, closely on undertakings affecting tribal lands. Now, I mentioned that TIPO jurisdiction is on tribal trust and reservation lands, but it's also, it's important to know that cultural resources are everywhere. Before Oregon became Oregon, Native people have lived here. Archaeologically speaking, we have data that shows occupation in Oregon ex extends back at least 15,000 years. We say a good place to live is a good place to live. The Coquille don't have a ratified treaty. Their lands were never ceded to the federal government. Um, but despite this, uh, many, many Coquille people were forcibly removed from their homes and sent to the coast reservation up around Yahats. Others were able to stay in the area, um, but it, it would never be like it was. Most of the land was parceled off to settlers, trappers, miners, and others under the Oregon Land Donation Act. So please know that places that are in public and private ownership today and under SHPO jurisdiction are still important places to the tribes. So while TIPOs don't formally have jurisdiction over those places, we do consult and coordinate with local, state, um, and federal agencies and even private landowners on how various activities will affect historic properties and archaeological sites. Um, 
we also, just, um, just to clarify that um, tribes are not only interested in archeological resources. You know, tribes are still here today and that, that um, their interest in their occupation continues. And so when we talk about historic resources, many historic resources are also tribal resources. So TIPOs have a lot of other duties too. Um, I won't get into what all of those are, but the primary job is to protect and manage cultural resources throughout the tribe's entire area of interest, not just those places that they have um, TIPO jurisdiction on. This slide here summarizes um, what those primary functions are, um, and they're basically the same as those of SHPO. So um, next slide. It's also important to understand that because of the history of federal Indian policy and forced removal, tribes are structured differently today than they were in the past. Looking at southern, uh, the Southern Oregon coast today, uh, tribes, um, there are multiple tribes that have, an, have interest in the same place and the same resources. One tribe cannot speak for another. Um, and so in, for the Southern Oregon coast, uh, in the, the Port Orford area that we're gonna be talking about today, just a very brief summary. Um, the Coquil Indian tribe um, are the descendants of the people who stayed on their homelands or returned from the coast reservation. Those that stayed up north may be members of the Confederated Tribes of Salettes. Um, you can see on this map here the faint outline of the coast reservation um, starting along the central coast and following up north. It's a little bit boxy in comparison to others highlighted on this map. Um, depending on where you are in southwestern Oregon, um, there may be other tribes that have an interest in this area as well. Um, if you're in Coos Bay, uh, the Confederated Tribes of Coos Lorum Consayusla, and um, you may have heard uh, Jesse Beers' talk yesterday, you may have covered a little bit of that. So if you have a project that may affect an archeological site or historic property or ancestral remains, you will need to coordinate with SHPO and likely multiple tribes. And all of that coordination may sound a little daunting, but um, I assure you, we will always do our best to make the process as simple as possible. If you aren't sure which tribes have an interest in your area, you can either contact SHPO or the Oregon's Legislative Commission on Indian Services, LCIS. Um, so on this map, down on the uh, bottom uh, coastal corner, you will see a star, a little blue star, and that uh, star shows the location of Battle Rock, which is the location that we're going to be talking more about in just a minute. Um, next slide. I will pause here and just say that um, the details about places like this are often confidential. Um, this is a unique case though in that everything that I'm sharing today is already in public domain. That said, state law protects archaeological sites and the graves of Native people. It is illegal in Oregon to remove archeological material from a site without a permit. Um, and it is illegal to disturb a grave or possess the name, uh, remains of a native person. If you encounter a site or an exposed grave, please leave it in place and contact either myself or your local tribe if you aren't in this area or the State Historic Preservation Office immediately. Uh, we will help you and the landowner to address the exposed site or ancestor. If you uh, find that you, yourself or your family member has, um, for one reason or, or another, um, is in possession of um, archaeological material or, um, unfortunately, uh, ancestral remains, please contact us. Um, we are not in the business of um, making trouble for anyone. We just want to see the ancestors. Um, taken care of and returned back to where they belong. Uh, next slide. So with that background, let's talk about um, Battle Rock. Port Orford has been home to the Quitoma people since time immemorial. 
the Kotoma people are ancestors to the Coquel, um, but and not all that distant, right? 170 years is not really that long ago in the grand scheme of things. The Kotoma people spoke a dialect of the Athabascan language family known as Tututni, and the community at Port Orford um, considered, uh, consisted of a number of villages. These villages had strong ties to one another and um, to villages a little further away, including the Nosoma people in Bandon. Battle Rock is in Port Orford. Um, today, it is a popular tourist attraction um, that has a very short hike across a sea stack with breath breathtaking views. Um, on the map on the right, there's a little circle and that just kind of shows you where it is kind of overall. Battle Rock, and I'm gonna try to pronounce the Athabascan word. Please bear with me as I am, I'm a very early learner in Athabascan. Um, and if I am pronouncing it incorrectly, uh, I apologize. Again, I'm still learning. Um, Battle Rock is also known as Mana Hesa in Athabascan, and that means a place to prime muscles from the rock. It's a place of both cultural significance for the Coquel and a place that carries a bloody history. The story of this place and its importance does not begin in the 19th century, but that's the portion of the story that we're gonna talk about today. Oregon's coast, uh, it was known to Russian, Spanish, and British navigators throughout the 18th century and probably earlier, but there are not a lot of written narratives prior to that time. In 1792, a British naval officer named George Vancouver sailed along the south coast where he visited uh, previously as part of uh, one of Captain James Cook's expeditions. Vancouver's ships stopped off of Cape Orford, as Port Orford was known at the time, um, and he writes in his journals, there were many smokes on shore from which canoes approached and boarded the vessels to trade for nails, tools, and other items. A few other ships land in Port Orford over the next few years, including the Lady Washington and various uh, merchant trading vessels um, in 1817 and 1827. Um, contact between these sailors and the Quitoma and others uh, during that time was minimal, uh, though it was noted as friendly. Um, and the famed Jedediah Smith made his way through Port Orford over land in 1828, noting only that he hardly saw any native presence in the area. After the initial gold rush in California, an active commerce began up and down the coast. Uh, one William Titchener, a captain of a small ship, a steamer named the Seagull, was seeking a port of entry into southwestern Oregon for gold. Um, he planned to establish a town at Port Orford. Next slide, please. Thank you. So on June 9th, 1851, the Seagull landed on the beach at Port Orford, leaving a small party of nine men ashore with instructions to establish a town site, search for a trail into the mountains, and await the arrival of more men in just 14 days. That party led, uh, it was met, led by a man named Kirkpatrick. Um, they were left with a few provisions, rifles, and one small cannon at Kirkpatrick's insistence. The men set up camp, uh, camp on top of the sea stack uh, accessible from the beach, and the tragedy that followed uh, is where the place now gets its name, Battle Rock. There are a few firsthand accounts from the sailors who took refuge on the rock, less in the way of documented testimony from the tribal perspective, though tribal member George Wasson wrote um, in his dissertation of the story as it was passed down to him. Um, the men in his party, I don't have photos of all of those men. The three that I was able to find photos for are pictured here. Um, there's a little bit of confusion in a number of the publications about Titchener's crew. Um, about Kirkpatrick in particular, and there are several photos of a man who um, Kirkpatrick's family say is absolutely not him. Uh, there is some speculation it may be his brother, but so if you see uh, other photos of Kirkpatrick, um, there's historic records are a little spotty, and, and uh, this is the, the photo that is pre uh, presented by his uh, descendants. 
According to the sailors' written testimony about the battle, uh, Quitoma, the Quitoma instructed the sailors to leave. Well, their ship had already left, so they were there to stay for another 14 days. Tensions rose, and the next morning, fighting ensued. There are, however, a number of versions to the Battle Rock story, um, and many of those versions say that the Quitoma did not attack, or at least not initially, and uh, that they instead anticipated payment for their assistance to Titchener's landing party, and were instead blasted by cannon um, as they assembled peaceably on Battle Rock. The initial battle, or massacre, uh, lasted about 15 minutes, according to the sailor's stories. Accounts vary about how many Native people were involved, varying from 40 to over 300. We do know that historical accounts are sometimes exaggerated. What we do know is that two of Kirkpatrick's men were injured but survived the duration. Though each account varies, at least 20 Quitoma were killed and more were wounded in the initial fight. These men were taken home to be buried. Um, and a ceasefire was made with an agreement that the men would leave in 14 days. The ship ultimately was delayed in San Francisco, unbeknownst to the crew. Um, Kirkpatrick reports that after they didn't leave on the agreed upon day, they were again set upon by the Quitoma. Low on ammunition and heavily outnumbered, they fled on that 15th day heading northward on foot. There, they were received uh, at a village south of Coos Bay, given food and transport across the bay, and eventually reached the Willamette Valley. Um, the bloody history of Battle Rock doesn't stop with the retreat of Kirkpatrick and his men, however. Um, as a result of the battle and the events that would follow, Battle Rock itself would become a cemetery. Next slide, please. There are two components to the cemetery atop Battle Rock. One, which speaks directly to the treatment of Native people by white settlers and soldiers, not only in Port Orford, but throughout all of Oregon and really throughout the United States. At least two, but possibly three unmarked graves are reported on top of Battle Rock. These unmarked graves belong to Native men who were lynched in 1856 and 1857. The first grave, belonging to a Coquel man, whose name we do not know, who was hanged on May 7th, 1856, for his suspected involvement in the death of white men a few years prior along the Coquille River. This man was reportedly buried at the foot of his gallows on top of Battle Rock. A second man, a second unmarked grave, belongs to a man named Enos. There are many spellings for his name. Uh, he's often also confused with um, another man by the same name in various historic accounts. Enos was a French Canadian Iroquois man who worked for the US military for a time before reportedly leading a revolt. Enos was a major player in the Rogue River War and um, on April 12th, 1857, Enos was hanged on Battle Rock for the murder of Captain Ben Wright in February or March of 1856, the year prior. There was a letter posted to the Crescent City Herald by someone with the moniker CSL, who states that Enos was tried by jury and convicted of murder with strong evidence and that he was hanged that day. The full story of the so-called trial with, uh, of Enos was published by Alexander Chase and several others in the years that followed. Those testimonies agree that there was no evidence present, presented at trial and Enos was acquitted. The testimony of Port Orford's then Sheriff Riley, who was the keeper of the jail at the time, says that Enos was released from his chains and set free. Meanwhile, an informal and illegitimate tri uh, tribunal condemned Enos. And upon his release from legal custody, Enos was seized by these people, dragged to the summit, and hanged. Descendants of Riley and other early settler families support these later events, um, 
unfortunately for years following, the story of his death is also confused in uh, reports of the death of another alleged murderer a year later. Um, it, it's, it can be a little uh, tricky to sort out um, fact from fiction. Um, and there, there isn't one comprehensive document about him, but uh, Dr. Mark Tveskov, a professor at Sula um, Southern Oregon University, is working on a report about the Rogue River Indian War. So hopefully we'll see uh, some more information and, and something, um, something more soon. A few months after Enos was hanged, another California native, whose name, again, we do not know, was also hanged from the same tree. There's very little documentation for this individual's death or um, his burial. Um, we also don't know the precise location of these unmarked graves, only that they were near the foot of a large tree on top of Battle Rock. Today, several large trees are present, um, though most are dead and partially fallen from the quickly eroding surface of the rock. The erosion, hastened by the harsh winds and heavy foot traffic, have made the mid-19th century landscape atop Battle Rock difficult to interpret, and it makes preservation and protection of these graves challenging. Uh, a late, in a later slide, we'll show um, some of the changes, so um, just bear with me. In a more formal style cemetery, there um, rest three members of the Summers family. Ralph Erastus Summers, also known as Jake, Betsy Taylor and their son, uh, Ralph Jr. Jake um, pictured, actually, can you go back to the previous slide? Here you go. Yeah. Jake pictured here um, on the farthest to the right uh, was one of the nine men left by the seagull to claim the harbor for the white settlers and was a participant in the battle. Um, you can go back to the next one. Thank you. Betsy was a Coquel to Tootney woman. Um, at her preference, no known photos exist of Betsy. Um, Jake and Betsy are survived today by their grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are enrolled in the Coquille Indian tribe. Jake, Betsy, and Ralph uh, were disinterred from their family plot near Flores Creek on a Memorial Day, we think in 1937, um, though the exact year is uh, still in question and um, they were reburied in a vault carved into Battle Rock. The Summers grave site features a marker that was placed by the Port Orford Chamber of Commerce in 1953, um, and there was previous fencing that had been installed sometime in the late 1990s, which was composed of four wooden posts connected by a chain. Uh, the center image, uh, 2015, um, you can see those four wooden posts had fallen down uh, they were fell or were knocked over sometime in the 2010s. Um, the fourth fell between 2015 and 2019. The hiking trail across the rock continues to shift over years, most recently leading hikers to walk over the marker and the grave. They've been vandalized um, a number of times uh, and uh, as you can see uh, the vegetation just kind of takes over up there. Um, the picture on the bottom left, uh, 1937, that photo is of the um, men who were disinterring the um, Summers family from their family plot. There are other photos, um, but out of respect for the family, um, I'm not going to share those um, here. Uh, next slide. So in August of 2020, Coquille tribal members, one being the son, uh, the grandson of Jake Summers and other tribal staff worked to install new fencing around the vault and protect the Summers family's resting place. The fencing was intended to indicate to hikers that the marker represents a cemetery, um, encouraging visitors to pay their respects while preventing them from inadvertently walking over the grave and causing damage to the marker. Um, there had been a number of, of um, stories going around that that marker was simply a marker, that there, the Summerses had been maybe moved in pre, uh, years previous. Um, that is not the case. 
Um, so just trying to highlight, this is still a cemetery. The new fencing is stainless steel uh, with a cement border designed to stand up to the sea stack's extreme weather conditions, salt air, heavy winds, and um, just, just a lot of stuff going on up there. The design was also chosen to avoid any ground disturbance. Um, as I mentioned, you're, it's illegal to excavate an archaeological site without a permit um, and to avoid having to do so. So the fencing and the wooden preform for the border were built in advance and all of the materials were actually hauled up the rock. And you can see uh, that work being done in the picture here on the left. Um, uh, one of the ways that TIPOs work to prevent important sites is called, mon or to protect important sites is called monitoring. Um, really, it sounds exactly like what it is. Uh, you monitor activity that's being conducted. So while this fencing was constructed, uh, my staff and I monitored the, monitored the activity to ensure that it met with the state requirements for no ground disturbance and to ensure that no cultural material was accidentally kicked up or disturbed while we were doing the work. Unfortunately, monitoring for intentional harm is much more difficult and cement takes a long time to dry, especially in humid environments. Um, and we can't stay up all night, um, can't stay um, in dangerous conditions for um, overnight. So next slide, please. The work that tribal members and staff did to protect the cemetery provided a new opportunity for vandals to deface the summer's grave again. This time by drawing uh, into the cement as it dried, scratching in a number of places, uh, vulgar doodles, the word pard, uh, twice. We don't know what that word means, uh, P-A-R-D and P-A-R-D-S. Um, and the F word. Uh, which I have blocked out here with a red star. Um, the initials on either side of the ladder are not vandalism, but were left intentionally by two of the tribal members who participated in the construction of the fencing um, in memorial. The vandalism was reported to Oregon State Parks and it remains an open case several months later. So if you do have any information about the vandalism, any clues about what uh, the word pard means, Please share that with either myself or OSP. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, tribal staff revisited the cemetery again, this time to repair the damaged cement as best as can be done in this difficult location. And we continue to monitor for additional damage, um, both now, it's dried and finalized now, but we'll continue to monitor um, in the future for both accidental and inadvertent um, damage. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm frequently asked uh, a number of questions about this, and so I'll just address those here um, before we close. The first is, um, is, this, uh, is the Battle Rock listed on the National Register of Historic Places? Um, and if not, are we going to do it? And so the uh, short answer to that is no, Battle Rock is not listed on the National Register at this time. It is eligible for listing on the National Register. Um, what eligibility is and how listing goes is a long conversation that um, perhaps we can have another time, but um, it is eligible, it is not listed. Um, perhaps one day someone will have an opportunity to finalize a nomination, either by the work that we've done um, recently um, or the work that Mark Deveskoff is doing. Um, perhaps we'll have, have an opportunity for a listing in the future. The second question um, is about the name. So I mentioned earlier that Battle Rock is known by two names. Um, at this time, no one is seeking a name change for the rock. Um, there are a number of um, ge <clears throat> geographical name changes all over the state happening. This is not one of them. Um, for the Coquille Indian tribe, uh, that question was brought up um, by someone else um, not too long ago. Um, and the, the response that, that um, came up through the culture committee was that 
Um, it's, it's okay to, to know a place by two names. Um, in this case, they represent different, different meanings, different things, um, but the name Battle Rock represents a significant portion of history for everyone in Oregon, not just the tribe. Um, and that name serves as a reminder of, to people of what happened there um, and of, of who rest there. So uh, I share all of this with you today because Battle Rock is uh, it's an example of the unique challenges that are presented where a sacred space um, and public space intersect. Historic cemeteries are usually public knowledge. Pre-contact cemeteries um, and other culturally significant places like archaeological sites, as I mentioned, are usually confidential. Their locations are recorded and protected by state and tribal historic preservation officers. Um, but where a place is publicly accessible, confidentiality, while it can, it, it can serve to protect those places uh, that would cause it intentional harm, like vandalism or looting, but where confidentiality or restricted access is not possible or even preferred, um, we engage the public as stewards, as protectors of place. Um, so having heard this story, I hope that you will help to serve in that role as well um, as, as stewards to Battle Rock. Battle Rock is a very public place and it's well known for its history and for its beauty. It's also sheltered by a steep climb and dense shrubbery, which reduces the view of those activities from below. Add uh, heavy erosion to the rock by frequent visitors and extreme weather conditions. Monitoring of the cemetery and the trails becomes a really delicate balance. For every visit to the top of the rock, even with the best of intentions, we increase the risk of erosion and of disturbance to those that are resting there. This kind of damage needs mitigation as well, it needs to be addressed. Um, so the city is working, uh, the tribe and the city are working together on ways to decrease erosion and damage to the rock. One proposal raised by a citizen of Port Orford uh, was to restrict access to Battle Rock entirely. Um, that idea was not adopted by the city. Another proposal by the city itself is in the works, and that is a new park with similar views that are offered by Battle Rock to defer foot traffic more passively away from the rock itself while not outright restricting it. Even by decreasing visitors just by a quarter, it could make a huge difference in slowing the erosion and protecting the site, uh, the places. And so the tribe and the city, uh, we continue to seek collaborative opportunities for protecting this really important place um, and those that are resting there. Um, go ahead, oh wait, let me, um, so the, uh, on the left is a sketch of the rock about 30 years after the battle. Um, 1920 on the bottom, um, is the earliest photograph I have been able to locate. There may be others. Um, and tw uh, 2017, I took this photo um, while visiting the, the site. Um, and I just highlight this so you can see the changes in uh, the way the rock is shaped, at least um, in the last hundred years. Um, and, and you can see the, the changes even to the vegetation over those last hundred years. Um, so uh, next slide. Thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or call, my, uh, call me. That's my cell phone number. Um, my contact information, uh, the TIPO email address, uh, the second email address there is really for compliance pro uh, review. So if you have a property that you'd like to have us review and, and, or a project that you're gonna be doing and you wanna know if it's gonna affect an archeological site, um, please send the project details and the property details to that email address and we'll be happy to help review it for you. Um, my direct email is more for general inquiries and other contacts. So um, thank you.